Good evening. Wow, that's a lot of energy for the evening. <laughs> we need more energy now. I think everyone's kind of tired. At least I am. <laughs> so, you can't hear me. All right. That's a challenge. They can't hear me in the back. Is the speakers connected? <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me now? No? I think those speakers are maybe not connected. All right, if you can't hear me now, then you can come in the forward, in the front, right? So this is the first time we are trying this format. It's IMA, Ask Me Anything uh, format. How many people have uh, participated in some, something like this on Reddit? Because that's where it became originally popular. People would ask, people would go up on Reddit and post saying, I am uh, such and such person. Ask me anything you like. And some very interesting conversations, very interesting insights from people. Like, I've attempted suicide seven times. Ask me anything. Right? Uh, it was interesting to see how something like that could take off. So we said, you know, why not try and give that an agile spin, right? To try and uh, bring in some of our speakers and some of the people who helped us put this conference together and, you know, put them in front of you so that you guys can ask whatever you feel like uh, to these guys, expecting an honest and unfiltered answer. How many people are up for it? Very few people. Why are you here otherwise? All right, so without wasting too much time, I would like to call Jeff Patton. He's the first Bakra. <laughs> I like to be first because, uh, look, I will be the best so far. Uh, it can only get better from here. I'm Jeff Patton. I'm known for story mapping, and I spend a lot of time telling people they worry way too much about the way they write stories. Writing stories isn't the point. I'm going to stop there. Uh, ask me anything. Hypothetically, uh, we, will, we are in a world where Agile is going on. Uh, let's see that arena. What would be the next technology you would name? Uh, or the next buzzword which you would name going forward, if it, if it ever happens? Uh, say it again. The, what will be the next? So, so yeah. I mean, you had Agile coming into the picture. You had different things. What would you name the next phase if it comes with Agile diminution? What's the next thing after Agile? Yeah, uh, first, it's about time for Agile to be retired. Um, I, what is, um, uh, now that everybody's getting on board, I'm looking for the next thing. Uh, oddly, the next thing looks uh, like it's lean startup thinking and design thinking, and I'm already tired of that already, too. Um, uh, the, the, the next thing is for us to put words around how difficult it is for us to predict whether the stuff we're building is worth building at all, and lots of practice and thinking around that. And I think there's not a word for the next thing yet, and I'm waiting for it. Next. Yep. Hey Jeff, uh, why do we need these stories at all? Say it again. Why do we need stories at all? I mean, why do we need stories at all? So I spend a lot of time reminding people that stories get their name not from what we're supposed to write, but from how we're supposed to use them. Uh, Kent Beck referred to stories originally as an alternative way to work, not an alternative way to write, that instead of communicating what we want built with a document, uh, write anything down you want, but get together and tell me your story. Um, we need stories because we need to start talking with each other. And then I'll make another point, it isn't just talking, it isn't just words, it's words and pictures and uh, uh, diagrams and sticky notes and things we do to make a point. We need stories because we really suck at communicating with writing alone. That's the short answer. And we don't need written stories, we need people to actually work differently to actually tell stories.
Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm being much more concise than I normally am. <laughs> so, so um, do you need really smart people to make Agile work? If you, if you say yes, then is Agile important? If you have smart people, then they'll figure out. Yeah, that's a... Um, you just answered your question, I think. <laughs> I'll, I'll joke that uh, no process fixes stupid, uh, and uh, the, the truth is you, you can't take uninterested, unenlightened people and put them to work doing anything um, and, and expect good results. However, um, good process builds structure that lets people become interested, lets people become enlightened, lets people start to care, lets people tar start to take responsibility uh, for what they're doing. Um, I don't think, uh, uh, some days I think differently than other days, uh, but I think there are a lot more smart people than we give them credit for. We just don't give them environments where they can, where they can grow, where they can be smart. We don't put them in situations where they're paid to be smart. We put them in situations where they're paid to follow instructions, they're paid to shut up and do what they're told. We need Agile to give us a framework to let people start to think again, but that's hard. Um, that's, I could ramble on, but I wouldn't be making any fresh points. I see a hand right there. Ah. Yeah. I want one, one question. Uh, in user history, what is the relevance of user? in you, the word user, because many times whenever we saw user story, the end user or who is going to use that user story is far behind. So why not only story, why user story? That's a good question. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I started with this process called extreme programming in 2000, and that's where the concept came from. And actually when it was defined, it was called a story, not a user story. Now, what we're supposed to be talking about when we tell a story isn't the specification or the requirement or what to build. What we're supposed to be talking about is who needs what we're building and why. And there were a lot of modifications we made to the concept of stories to make, well, to help people remember to talk about the right thing. One of the first things they did is say, well, it should be delivered from a user's perspective, so let's call it a user story. One of the next uh, modifications that was made was to, well, the... The, the very dogmatic template, the as a type of user, I want this thing so that. But hey, look, calling a user story makes people say, wow, well, it's if I'm writing a back-end system that's headless, it can't be a user story. Or if I'm writing something about a business rule deep into the bowels of the system uh, that the enforces something the user would probably rather I doesn't care about, makes it sort of not a user story. I go back to what I originally learned, that they are stories, not user stories, and it's important to talk about the, the users and the choosers, the, the customers, the people who pay for this stuff to be built. And when I'm dealing with com commercial products, it's the users that will use this stuff, the choosers, the people who buy the stuff, and your company, your organization, and what it's trying to achieve by building that product on the market, and all the whys behind all of those things. That's a good story conversation. So I'm with you. I'm not sure they, I go back and forth between calling them stories and user stories, but uh, unfortunately it's the word we're saddled with now. Don't know if that helps. So um, all along in the sessions, we, we, have talk, we spoke about cultural change, we spoke about number of problems that we can solve through Ajay. So in your view, what are the problems that we cannot solve through Ajay? Uh, sorry, the sound it kind of stinks here. Is it, what are the problems we can't solve with? Through Agile, yeah. Through Agile. Agile is not a solution. Ah, crap, that's another hard one. Um, it, 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 at its heart, I'll see an Agile process as something that is built to pay attention, to respond to change over following a plan, to, uh, the, to work to collaborate with each other. And um, look, I, I, it's my personal bias that working in short cycles, collaborating well with each other, um, it works almost anywhere. Um, 
the, some of the things that get left out of Agile that bother me are uh, principles like working software is the primary measure of progress. Uh, in a lot of situations I work in, learning is the primary measure of progress. The, the, the work we do to figure out whether we should be building working software at all is, is valuable, and Agile tends not to value that. So, uh, look, I have an article due that I'm supposed to write tonight uh, sub to submit to a, an accelerator program in the U.S., and it's about why Agile isn't appropriate for startups. Uh, in a startup context where we're trying to find a product solution where there is none now, what we value most is rapid learning. Working in two-week cycles and valuing only working software gets in the way of learning faster. And I'm confident there are some contexts where the, uh, the results are fairly predictable. Uh, Todd, what's the, the lower left-hand quadrant of the diagram you just showed? Uh, uh, is dogs, dog projects, things that where where the risk is low and the the certain uh, they're fairly certain. Hey, we may not need a responsive. Um, it may not be necessary uh, to work in that kind of responsive framework. That's a muddy answer. <laughs> I haven't thought thought it through, but thanks for asking. So I did. Am I All getting right. the hook? Is that ten minutes? Okay. Awesome. Thank That's you, Jeff. Time. Thank you. Who do we get next? Can we get Fred next? George, uh, I'm known for very fast delivery cycles, uh, and also therefore microservices and something we call programmer anarchy. I'm sure there are no questions. And there aren't, perfect. Um, I took a page out of Kent Beck's book, um, not literally his book, but uh, Kent Beck called it extreme programming back in the early Agile days. And I've I been doing this since about 1998, when, before the book was published. And I was out there trying to sell this to my customers. And I kept telling Kent, wow, you know, customers are already, or, you know, companies are already afraid of programmers. Extreme programmers, they're really afraid of. But it got a lot of press. And so, um, when we were trying to do some recruiting for a company I was working at in London, and we had some very, very strange process associated with that, uh, I, w I reached through the bag of tricks and said, let's pull out a very controversial name. Uh, I called it Programmer Anarchy, because anarchy in its original definition, first definition is about a team that organizes itself. It's not some outside party doing that. Um, and the analogy is a bit like pirates. There's this book called The Invisible Hook, which talks about the social organization of pirates. There was no rule book. They were self-organizing. It's a very interesting sort of look at how social dynamics happen when that happens. Hence the name was very controversial. By the way, if you're in a consulting firm, I wouldn't use the word. Yeah. Agile loves polyglot programming. We want programmers to be willing to work in no matter what language. Uh, one of the things that we learned from microservices is, is the polyglot environment where no matter which language you write, uh, they can collaborate uh, using microservices. Uh, so now that we have such an environment, a programmer doesn't need to learn any language because using microservices, he can collaborate with anyone else. So there's, there's no uh, incentive for the programmer now to learn multiple platforms because the platform that uh, we're going to use is going to be, uh, it's going to be possible to work in multiple <coughs> different environments, no matter what. So uh, are, you, are you suggesting that uh, now that this platform is available, programmers don't need to learn uh, a whole lot of tools and languages? So sort of the base of the question happens to be that, you know, microservices as, as specified are very, very small pieces of code that are independent of each other, very loosely coupled. Uh, they exchange, use RESTful interfaces, they publish on buses, uh, and they use JSON packets. So lots of programming languages support these constructs. And so if you're a microservice architecture, you're allowed to basically write code in different languages. Um, so I, most programmers I know of that have been microservices take advantage of that to show off new languages that they think may be very cool for doing the particular problem they're trying to solve. Um, 
we were doing some work for a, a web-based client in London, um, we wrote the original version of a service in Ruby. It was about 600 lines of code to completely encapsulate an algorithm. Um, but they heard about Clojure, so let's try Clojure. So they wrote a 300 line version of Clojure. They said, oh, this is very cool. Um, but it also, now that I understand, really understand Clojure, because now I've written something, let me write it again. and wrote a 200 line version uh, that turned out to basically replace four different dedicated hardware boxes of, of significant size. Um, so I think programmers, you know, given the willingness to explore, this actually enables that. Uh, yes, if you're a, uh, let's say, Fortran programmer and you still want to write Fortran, uh, maybe microservices is also an environment for you as well. So, so your faster delivery, what is your view on if it is done in a legacy system or a complex enterprise products, what does it mean for you? In general, you always want to be accelerating delivery times. I think the difference between where we stand in 1998, the beginning of this agile stuff, and where we stand today is, is our cycle times are much, much shorter. Uh, back in the day, Kent Beck's cycle time, Kent Beck was one of the fastest cycles back right there with XP compared to the others, and he was in three week cycles. Uh, now you have people delivering almost daily in some environments. Uh, so this acceleration has occurred. Um, so, Mm, I'm trying to think of a n nice way of saying this. Uh, ask the question again, though. Let me see. Let me see if I can figure out a nicer way to say it. In the, in the legacy world, right? for example, you're using football, you're using enterprise. Le legacy product. code is never going to go faster than what it does now. It's been designed with a certain process in mind, and it's been built that with that process in mind. Um, but you want to take legacy code and do the same things that sort of Michael Feathers talks about in his book for many years ago. You also want to do the same sort of thing we, I do with most of our clients. Find something new that needs to be built, build it a new way and attach it in there. Uh, I worked a lot with Fortune 100 clients in my last uh, role in California. And almost all of these Fortune 100 companies have data warehouses and ETL processes to get data out of it. Almost all these clients also have transactional APIs into their production systems. So it's pretty easy to go grab some data out of the data warehouse, do something with it, draw some conclusions, and publish it back to the transactional API. And that's how our business, we're building our business around those concepts. One last question. Um, the question is little outside of the software world. Uh, recently, I read an article where a wedding planner applied Scrum on the wedding plan and executed it in sprints. Uh, what's the weirdest place you've seen uh, Agile being applied? And did you think about faster delivery there? I think the strangest thing I saw was when I was working in London at the company Forward. Um, we basically, at that point, were shipping something new into production every three and a half minutes. Uh, the average cycle, average project size was one person for four hours. Uh, so uh, in that environment, there were no handoffs. Uh, and what you, the shift was moving from requirements thinking into idea attempts, trying out ideas. It's, it's what we're trying to do. And I think it's the next, by the way, I think it's the next focus for Agile. It's going to be Get, us, get our customers away from thinking about requirements, get them into, let's have some ideas and try them out, uh, do experiments. And we were doing that. Uh, and we were extremely successful at that. We had, a, at one point, our company had 50 employees. We made 50 million pounds that year uh, with 50 employees just by just trying out ideas and finding out which ones failed fast. Um, so yeah, I think some of the things that have been talked about here, especially the accelerating, working with business differently, uh, that's at the heart of most of the businesses I've been working with for the last five or ten years, uh, is working differently like that. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So you said uh, you, you have expertise in delivering faster. So uh, you know, we often hear from the customer that the delivery is not faster. So when you say the speed of the delivery, is it like planning, uh, delivering ahead of the schedule and estimation, or delivering as per the plan? So how do I define whether we are doing it faster? When I find delivery, it's, it's from an idea to getting the code into production. And that was four hours. Um, that allows you to try ideas out. Now, our systems are fairly robust. We understand when things, when you have a bad idea, it's pretty obvious because we're watching the KPIs. Uh, and that's, a, again, I, I think there was a lovely talk about Sriram in this room a few hours ago, where he talks about trying to get the biz, development team to start focusing on the business results. Uh, that's what we do. We measure business results, clicks, if it's clicks, if it's money, 
if it's sales, if it's logins, that's what we're measuring ourselves against. And we have ideas about how to make more of those. So you, want your, you basically have to teach your programmers more about the domain than we've done in the past. They have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, when, and armed with that, they have a lot of clever ideas of their own. And I think I'm being pulled. I think that's good. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Next, can we have TV? So I'm TV. Tathagat uh, is my name, but uh, everyone calls me TV. So I'm TV. Uh, and uh, I'm a volunteer for Agile India Conference, work with Naresh uh, for the last few years. And um, uh, in addition to that, as a day job, I'm a agility coach. Uh, I help large organizations uh, improve their agility. Uh, ask me anything. He's also the program chair for the, this team. For the, uh, for the uh, scaling agility. Yeah. Thanks, Naresh. Sure, we see two hands there. Uh, agility transformation. Uh, so I have a different uh, perspective on that, uh, which I used uh, when I was at Yahoo. Uh, my strategy is not to boil the ocean, uh, and uh, really, uh, the, the, in my view, the goal should not be 100% adoption. Uh, so if I, if I just use the phrase, instead of 80-20 adoption, I look at 20-80 adoption, and let me just take a minute to explain that. Instead of 80%, which is a, which is a, a kind of a notional way to say 100% adoption is what we are looking for, which tends to end up only very patchy and shallow, uh, so that's 20%. I would rather take 20% of my products that are really, uh, that can really move the needle when I really improve the agility quotient on that. And there I want to really improve my agility quotient 80%, 100%. Uh, I believe those are more successful rather than really boiling the ocean and saying everybody under the roof has to uh, follow a certain blend of uh, agile. Thank so. you. Yeah. Uh, Krishnamurti, I wanted to know how I can volunteer uh, to such programs. Okay, wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, there are n number of ways to volunteer, uh, and I think the first thing you probably want to do is sign up for agileindia.org uh, mailing list. Uh, whenever the new programs keep getting announced, uh, you have the first opportunity to pay your dues. I think the best way to get involved in this community is to pay your dues uh, and make the withdrawals later. Uh, you, you keep paying the dues and people will pick up and people will know that, hey, you are the guy, you are the go-to guy and we want to really have you on this team. Uh, and, and have trust in the system that somebody is going to pick you up as soon as you are, you are really shining out there. Uh, that's what uh, uh, has worked for me. That's what I know has worked for a lot of people I know. Uh, I'm sure it's going to work for you as well. Hi. Uh, uh, my question is uh, more on the T-shirt that is given. It has a lot of advertisement at back, which makes it completely useless. I don't know how many people. So I it. would. Uh, so with the, with it's an honest feedback, which because the morning yeah. Naresh asked, so I'm giving honest feedback. No, thanks for your feedback. I just want to be respectful to our sponsors as well. And first, I want to also correct my mistake because morning when I stood here right after Diana's talk, I called out the sponsors. I made a mistake of not introducing our key sponsor, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, which I was promptly reminded. So mistake corrected on the same day it was made. Right. Uh, secondly, just to your question, I think uh, I would have a slightly different point of view. Uh, I think we are able to defray the cost of uh, running, an, uh, running a conference like that and make sure that it's very wallet friendly uh, by having a bunch of speakers come down. And we actually host a lot of logistics uh, for a lot of speakers that we get down to Bangalore. Would not be possible if we were not willing to collaborate with a lot of sponsors. So uh, I would uh, probably uh, request you to be uh, just, just change your shoes a while and just see it from that point of view. I'm sure you will see uh, a, a, a different perspective there, uh, which allows us to actually do it uh, without worrying about, because if we had to do the same thing, we would probably be charging 20,000 bucks from, for every day if we just had to do that, just to kind of put a perspective there. So I think, uh, and, and obviously the sponsors have to see a value in, in being, them, be, them being there. Uh, and uh, the standard way of doing that, one of them is really to have uh, like lanyards and, and t-shirts, so, so uh, I hope that's fine with you. 
but that's the accepted form of how we really brand some of these goodies today. Well, point noted. We'll try and do that next time. <laughs> Ideas are always uh, welcome. Yes, yeah. In a Indian context, what do you think is the uh, biggest impediment to having a agile mindset? Uh, I think Indian, our Indian work context. Uh, Indian context. We. I. I. I, see, I will. I will give you bonus as three points actually, uh, and you'll have to pick up depending on your context. One is I think we have an obsession of. of uh, we. We. I, I think we are under a genetic trap uh, of thousand years of being subservient, uh, we, we do not believe that we can actually do something by ourselves. We believe that somebody has to tell us only then we are going to do something there. That's my personal take on things. Uh, number two, we are a society obsessed with uh, accomplishment, uh, titles, and uh, social status, uh, which actually impedes our free thinking and ability to be ourselves. I mean, how many people will actually want to step out from a... Pe it's, it's, it's like some of you who don't understand Hindi, pardon me, I'll try and do that, but one of the things we were discussing a few weeks back in another conference was this mindset of kitne admi the. It's like how many people were uh, under your command and control, right? That kind of a thing. I think we have a, we have a, we have a very, very bad obsession with this uh, thing. Unless we get out of that thinking, we are not going to do that. Um, and uh, uh, the third thing is, I think uh, the teamwork kind of a thing, uh, it, it's like our cricket team is just learning how to use teamwork properly, right? Uh, for, a, for a long period of time, we were all stars, but then we never, when we got together, there was a lot of uh, fireworks, and not really the, uh, in the right sense. I think we have to learn how to be a great team uh, without really bringing ego in between. Uh, so I think those are three things from my point. What do you think contribute positively to the agenda? Uh, come again, what, what do you think? The, the, the opposite of it. What, what, are natural, what are things that naturally help, help an agenda? So I think the great uh, uh, faith and hope that I have is actually the people. Uh, I, I think the fourth point I didn't include was actually uh, people like me who are the biggest impediments to that. Uh, because we came from the old school of thought, and if we don't like to change, uh, we have a serious problem in the organizations. When I walk into the organizations, I see there are a lot of people like me who are actually uh, very ossified with their uh, thinking. And the biggest hope, that's why, is, is all the coming generation that has never known a world where there was a waterfall uh, development happening. I mean, when I actually go there and I try to put up the slide on this is how we used to do a waterfall, I now have to remove it purposefully because that uh, people don't know that. That part of history is not known to a lot of people today. I think that's a great part of uh, being there. So I think uh, the memory erase is, is, is the right thing that's happening there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, yeah. So thanks. We'll take the compliment open-heartedly. Uh, we'll also <laughs> sign you up for the next uh, volunteer event. Thank you, with your permission. But uh, on a more uh, serious note, yes, we would like to. In fact, we 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 don't really go out and really make any gender discrimination on that. We love to have as many people, as much diversity as we can. I know, and I'm sure I speak for Naresh as well. That uh, given an equal opportunity, we would actually want to have more women come here and speak uh, there. Uh, I hope if there is an opportunity to actually find some ways. Uh, I have spoken at Grace Hopper in the past. I would love to get an opportunity to do more at uh, Grace Hopper and a lot of other events. Uh, we would like to explore more opportunities. So with your guidance, I'm sure we can do more. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll just pitch in here. Uh, I think we've had multiple places where we had a proposal come in and you know, immediate reaction by the group was everyone wanted it down. Right? And we would reject the proposal because we would say this is an act. But then one exception we would make to that is we would say, OK, if it is uh, someone coming from one of the groups that we want to encourage, right? it could be students, it could be people from other parts of the you know, world that are not very well recognized as a software giant, we would actually make an exception in the sense that we would go back, give them feedback, we would say, can you change your proposal this way? We think it is better to position it this way. And we take those steps to encourage more of that. At the end of the day, I think, you know, it's again what, how they come back is what we decide. But when we do the final cut, we, we make sure that we are giving everyone an equal opportunity. 
Okay, uh, my question is, uh, I mean, uh, you have been doing it uh, in uh, many cities, I mean, uh, last year you have done it. Okay, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear now. Okay. Yeah, so are you planning to uh, do it in Mumbai next time? Uh, I'm sorry, the sound sure. is getting a little muffled. We've muffin. been doing this conference in Bangalore. Do we have any plans of doing Do we have any Mumbai? plans of doing it in Mumbai? Mumbai right. uh, it all depends on uh, well-being people. Uh, if, if you come again, I mean, Naresh is based out of Mumbai. Uh, I did hear uh, Naresh one uh, complaint actually that your heart is in Bangalore. Uh, a lot of Mumbaikers feel that way. So I guess maybe it's an opportunity to show that his heart is in Mumbai as well. Uh, but on uh, more uh, serious notes, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I actually want to just call out a one small example. Uh, uh, and, and I might be pitching for another conference, but just to illustrate the entrepreneurship that is there. Uh, last year when Sarab organized Agile Noida in, in August, we had two people from Chandigarh. And Chandigarh doesn't have any culture, really. We, haven't, we have done, I, I'm sure we have done in the past once. And these two guys went back to Chandigarh and said, why there cannot be an Agile conference in Chandigarh? They went, they, they kept doing the heavy lifting in the background, they worked it. Uh, and in one week from now, we are having the, first, the Agile Chandigarh conference happening in ISB campus. They have been able to get uh, ISB campus for hosting the conference. Uh, uh, so I think if, if two, it, it only requires, to be honest, just two or three people to organize an event of this kind. And I'm sure as, if your intentions are right, if your efforts are good, people will come and just follow you. So uh, we are here to support. Whatever help you want, we will come down. A lot of us will actually fly down on our cost just to make sure that it's successful. So just let us know whatever help you want, and we'll be happy to do it for you. Okay, they actually you. pay speakers to fly to smaller cities. We don't pay speakers to fly to this conference, just, just as a note. We paid people to go to Kerala and speak. We paid people to go to Goa and speak because we want to encourage smaller, more focused conferences. Here we don't do that. Uh, you know, we make some exceptions, but we met most speakers we don't pay uh, you know, their flights and things like that. So that's stuff like that we, we do to encourage more smaller conferences. All right, I, think I guess I'm done. Up. Thank you. Thanks, Naresh. Thanks, TV. Uh, my name's uh, Sean. I'm an accidental agile coach and a unapologetic uh, commander and controller. So they, they said you can ask me anything, but they, they didn't say anything about baiting the conversation. So, <laughs> and any questions? Ask me anything. The, it's, it's funny because the mindset actually wasn't a shift very much at all. Um, I, I started my, like, my come out of the army, spent my first day working in a, in a software company um, as, a, as a product owner for a defense company. And um, on the very first day, they say, okay, we're doing this agile thing. We know it's not going to make any sense to you. And there's this thing called servant leadership. <laughs> and there's like, it's going to be this big surprise to me. Like, well, yeah, that's actually what I've been taught for the last 13 years because there's this funny thing that soldiers are people too and soldiers don't like being micromanaged any more than software developers do. So the reality is is they're incredibly, incredibly consistent and, it, and in terms of uh, leadership and how we want to um, give the whys and the overall direction because um, think about it this way, responding to change over following the plan when a battle situation, you actually have an enemy who is actively trying to destroy your plan by killing off your team members. So responding to change is actually really, really important in that situation. So the, the domains are incredibly consistent, actually. There wasn't much of a change at all. So what process would you recommend to increase the total energy in teams slash organizations? Because that seems to be the, the, the total energy in teams, that's a very good question. Um, there's a lot of talk about accountability. And lots of organizations really get focused on that. We want to hold people accountable and have accountability. And I look at it, at it from a, a different perspective. And I look at that from the, you know, the, a, small, you know, a small team in the, in the army again. You know, what, what kind of accountability do you have there? And what's the really powerful accountability? And I think it's a different kind. I don't think it's an accountability that uh, to you know, your, your boss or a commitment, the real powerful one, and if you've talked to people who've been in a, a combat situation, it's an 
utmost accountability to your, to your team members. You don't want to let your buddy down. And when you can foster that kind of environment of accountability where we've got shared objectives and I've got this really personal connection with my team members and I don't want to let my team members down, I think that creates a really, really positive uh, energy, uh, energy in the group. And uh, the other aspect to that is when you've got a leader on that team who will lead by example, who will jump in there and, and start demonstrating and, and modeling the behavior of, okay, this is what it looks like to collaborate, to communicate, to work together. And, and just like uh, we showed in, uh, Todd showed in the video in Apollo 13 and, and collectively solve a problem. I think if you look at those two things, it can be really powerful. Good question. Thank you. Um, I have mixed feelings on hierarchies. I think there's an, I think like anything, there's an optimum. Because on one hand, I care about uh, personnel development, people development. You know, we want to invest in people, and to do that, you actually have someone who has to take their time. So if I'm a, uh, a leader, a manager, I want to be developing the people underneath me, and I want to be really intimately involved in their needs and, and making sure that they can grow. That's difficult to do when I've got 30 people. I can't do a good job of it if I've got 30, 50 people directly reporting to me. But at the same time, we don't want to artificially create really, really deep structures that just add extra layers of, um, uh, it, it slows down decision making. So I think like anything, we really have to look at it as, as, as trade-offs. What are, what are the pros and cons? Um, and where do we find this optimum, you know, where do we find that optimum balance for us? So we're, that people can get properly developed while we're also not artificially creating um, bottlenecks in our decision making. Uh, Go ahead, yeah. Hi, uh, Vinod from MySys. Uh, given that when we are talking agile, I think things are moving really fast, both on development side and the business side. And one of the most common challenges that we face is that business priorities do change. Um, from release to release, where you invest, it completely changes. That means we have to reorient all the teams pretty much every six months. How do you handle this challenge when the real team delivery and the team velocity is a function of keeping the team together? Hmm. So af just, to, just so I understand, so after every after every release, the, the teams all shuffle around and people move around? Okay. Yeah, because the investments change. Let's say in, in a given release, if I, we invested 20% of our total, let's say, budget on one module, in the next release, it could drop down to 5%. So those other 15% of people have to be reallocated to somewhere else, where the next highest value will be delivered. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the easy answer, which isn't necessarily the one that's easy to implement. <laughs> um, you know, and it, going back to the, the military experience again, you know, there's, a, there's an economic benefit to having long-lasting teams, right? Because if you look at the uh, storming, norming, forming, performing model, right? Uh, usually it takes six months. In fact, I'm still working with teams that have been doing this for two years, and they're still learning how to work together to get to that high performance stage. So it makes very little economic sense for them to finally learn how to communicate and, and collaborate and work together, only to disband them and go through the process all over again. And you can apply the same thing to, to firefighters, special forces teams, uh, you know, like uh, uh, operating room teams. Um, so one way to look at it, if it's possible, is a, a team is kind of the smallest atomic unit. Right? If you want to move resources around, the only thing you can do is apply, apply a team to it. Now, you can time division multiplex a team. You can have one team that has multiple things, and, you can, and they can, um, they can uh, work on multiple things. But at, at the end of the day, you, you don't start worrying about people. In fact, I've seen lots of organizations always try to manage people. Well, it's this guy and, and, this, and this woman over here, and we start. No, no, it's look at a team as this atomic unit of resource that you can work with. That's exactly the challenge because you have to maintain some continuity because team size may go down from 10 to 4 
So those four guys will continue, but the other six people will get reallocated somewhere else. So I would say instead of reallocating the people to the other projects or other, I would say look at what that extra work is, the other priorities, and just and, and, and give that responsibility for the team. So instead of resource multiplexing, time multiplexing, I would suggest something to try. All right. I think we're good. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much. Hi, I'm Diana Larson, and um, the jet lag bit me this afternoon, and so I, I got a little late to this. But um, retrospectives, starting teams well, thinking about um, agile fluency, ask me anything. Uh, Diana, sorry, I'll be here. Ah, there you are, yeah. So uh, this question has been haunting for the last four and a half, five years. Uh, mm -hmm. Going up the ladder in the organization, I am still not able to convince the marketing folks. Uh, we, we, we work for organizations on a specific business value and a specific, uh, I would say, uh, on the profit, profit angle of it, right? I, it becomes very difficult to convince the marketing people uh, on this existing change. Uh, somewhere on the lower core, you have different frameworks and models which are, are working fine and there is self-sufficiency within the system. That. But once it comes to the final decision making, and when we talk about transparency or we talk about agile fluency at the program at the portfolio level, mm -hmm. uh, how and what would be the best way for a marketing guy? Because we have seen uh, marketing people getting commission based on the value of the uh, projects which they get. It's not about the value of the product. And eventually, we see services organization managing people, as uh, rightly mm -hmm. pointed out in the last uh, mm -hmm. uh, So, how would you want to actually? There is a change through this change agent to actually build the projects, not us who build the projects, especially the services organization. We are not small startups. Of course, things are changing dramatically, but there's still that question still haunts to a marketing guy. What would be the end cut which I'll get when I, when I go to deliver a particular program? And how would you want to uh, simulate a giant fluency model to build these people who, are, who actually pay their customer, the client, the executive, or the marketing? So I think one of the things that's going on is, is um, I, I, there may be a different model here. Um, in, with most of the companies that I've worked with, what you're describing happens with sales more than with marketing, right? Mar marketing tend to get it a little quicker than sales because of the commission structure that you're talking about. This is one of those places where Agile begins to bump up against the rest of the organization and how the rest of the organization does their work, right? And this is where we begin to see, you know, are we going to optimize for the sales guy in the organization to get his commission or her commission? Or are we going to look for what's best for the overall organization? There are some places where they are beginning to restructure the way sales are done and putting salespeople in teams and doing the same kind of um, joint accountability, the same kind of we're in this together that Sean was talking about for software teams with sales teams, right? So. That's one, one possibility. I, the way you frame the question, I find it really hard to convince anybody else of anything or to make anybody else think a certain way. What we have to do is use the persuasive technique of not trying to manipulate them into seeing things our way, but connecting with what's in their interests and how can we align together so that we're moving forward. Um, and as soon as I said that word, I'm hearing Dave Snowden in my head saying, <laughs> watch out with trying to get total alignment. We need that diversity. We need that diversity of perspectives, right? So. So there's a it's, a, it's a hard problem, and it's, a structure, it's an organizational structural problem about 
how people are compensated for their work. And some of those things have to be fundamentally rethought in terms of are we trying to serve the needs of a function or are we trying to serve the needs of the organization? And turning that on its head is a hard problem. I mean, there, are, there isn't an easy answer to your question, but that's the, what, the places where I have seen it be effective, it has happened because either the sales folks have just seen that this is gonna be better for everybody. They, they're able to take a longer view than just this month's commissions, or the organization has, has reformed itself so that that becomes a non-issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Krishnamurthy. Uh, see, uh, in the morning, you have taken Indian context-related examples to explain the fluency model. Mm -hmm. So as a participant, I really enjoyed. But as an agile coach, I want to ask a question. When you're coming for the first time to India, how come you can able to manage such an information at a faster pace? Uh, <laughs> I really wanted to ask you a question saying that uh, there is some message saying that you want to convey this in, in a locally conveyable thing? I just want to know your thoughts on it. Well, I have found that the best way to um, explain the concepts that I want to talk about is to make it relevant for the people that I'm talking to. And so uh, one of the analogies that seems to work pretty well for folks is that one of moving down a very large highway. And so um, I, in, if when I'm in the States, I talk about a different highway. There's a highway that runs up and down the West Coast called I-5, Interstate 5. And we talk about going from Seattle to LA and where we would stop along the way, right? In, in Europe, I have talked about going from, um, I think it was Frankfurt to Rome. And, you know, do we want to stop in Venice or do we want to stop in, in Rome? So, you know, there, there, that is an easy one to translate, right? Because all you have to do is find that main route that, because every city is unique and every city has its, its, own, um, its own specialness. And so I sat this morning with some folks and they, we looked at the map and we saw the highway that went from here north and, and there, there it was. So there you go. As you know, again, uh, I really enjoyed the session in the morning because we talked about scaling agile to the rest of the org. Mm -hmm. And clearly, agile principles are pretty universal, it, right? It, it's all about continuous improvement, innovation, sense of pride. And all these concepts existed even before the term agile came into the picture. And with the recent emphasis on a lot of these certifications, which again are sort of targeted toward processes and methodologies, isn't that diluting the message of agile when agile is more people focused than processes? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, the way I see it is that the agile way of approaching organizations is actually a part of a much bigger movement. And some of it has to do with this idea of continuous learning and continuous improvement in organizations. Some of it has to do with a um, a much larger movement toward more humane, more organizations that are more aware of the real asset that they have in the diversity of people, as opposed to thinking of them as a mass of interchangeable resources, right? Agile is not the only 
uh, way that is moving that idea forward at all. And if looking back, um, the, even coming out of, what, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, coming out of the big world war, Deming going to Japan, there were um, some folks in the UK, Fred Emery and Eric Trist, who were working in something called the Tavistock Institute. There are lots of, lots of folks uh, going far further back than that. There's a wonderful, if you've never read the writings of a woman named Mary Parker Follett, she's definitely somebody that you want to look up. So this has been moving along for some time, this idea that the best way to improve our world, whether by you know, selling peanut butter or building a car or what, whatever it might, whatever your particular idea of improving the world might be, it has to do with treating people in a humane way and in the last number of years, the ideas that you're going to hear more about later, uh, acknowledging that we that technology has moved us into an increasingly complex world. Um, listening to Sean talk about his experiences in the Canadian Army, there's also um, a new concept that has or a new buzzword, it's not a new concept, but a new buzzword that's come out of the U.S. Army War College called VUCA, V-U-C-A. And that, they, American military loves acronyms, and so <laughs> that stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it, originally, it was to describe the kinds of situations that Sean was saying, that when you are in battle, things change. You can't be trying to dictate from some headquarters site how people are going to move. They have to have the autonomy and the skill to make decisions in the face of rapidly changing conditions, right? So they came up with this idea of, you know, these, these folks are in VUCA situations. Well, a year and a half ago or so, there came out an article in the Harvard Business Review about, oh, it looks like the marketplace turns out to be volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And all of us need to live and understand how to, how to behave and act in that world. So when you put together the, the ideas around continuous learning and continuous improvement and finding ways to do what we do better, and the ideas around more humane workplaces, and the ideas around how are we able to move in a world where information moves so rapidly and things are changing and we can't really know so much of what we are dealing with is, emerges from the conditions that are present. Those three things are part of what Agile is talking about, but part of a much bigger group of things that are happening for organizations, societies, cultures. Um, and there are people who are very comfortable in not thinking in those ways. So then we, there's a lot of interesting clashes happening too. It's, it's the nature of how the world changes. So do I think Agile is particularly unique? No. Uh, but I do think it's a part of a, a broader shift in the way some folks are beginning to think about the world in, so that they can have an impact on it. We need to cut short, we kind of run over time. It, aren't these sort of formal certifications taking us backwards? Ah, uh, oh, the certification. Be more see, I was just, people. You, didn't you see how deftly I sidestepped the whole certification <laughs> issue there? Um, I, I, I was on the Agile Alliance board when the Agile Alliance board uh, wrote up a statement of philosophy about certifications. Todd was there too. 
<laughs> um, I'm, I'm troubled. I'm troubled by certifications. Um, I think it's a, it's a way of enabling, or it's an attempt, it's an attempt at enabling um, people to make easy decisions that should be hard. Right, we're gonna, cat if we can only get this group of people who are all categorized in some way, then we can pretend, again, that they are interchangeable, right? Rather than having to look at what they really bring, the, you know, the beauty of their diversity um, and the, the richness that's, that's held there. So I'm not a big fan of certifications. I understand the purpose they serve for human resources folks to be able to rapidly look at resumes or whatever and make choices and and I don't know that I think there's got to be a better way I think that that doesn't really serve us well um, and I'm one of a lot of people who've put that stake in the ground I'm not unique in that um, yeah and you know and and we all want to know how we are progressing we all like to get that mirror from the world about you know, that helps us understand our own ability to get things done and so on. And sometimes, you know, degrees and certifications and things can help us with that. But it can also blind us to the sort of unique and wonderful jewel that each person is and that the perspectives that they bring, the skills that they bring, and so on. So it, it's, a, it's a crutch. I think certifications are a crutch, and I'd much rather see us all walking strong. Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Can I quickly call upon Dave Snowden now? I've got no hesitation in answering that last question. Um, I think one of the disasters in Agile is you get more status by training and certification than by delivering code. Um, and the economic models are actually built around that. I once famously tweeted at a conference, SharePoint is to knowledge management, what Six Sigma is to innovation and SAFE is to Agile. Um, and I'm standing by that, right? Um, I think a couple of things coming out of that. We've had a major problem in Agile in that Scrum has become coterminous with Agile, which has denigrated both Scrum and Agile. Um, we've assumed that the executives aren't agile and need to be actually, they're a damn sight more agile than software they have been for years. Yet yeah, they're waiting for the software department to catch up. Yet yeah, what they're not prepared to do is to put corporate strategy into sprints, thank you very much. They've got better ways of doing that, right? So I, I think the issue about agility is to recognize that a software development concept of agility is not the same thing as a strategic concept of agility. Yeah, and I've sat in both of those. And I think this, I, I go further than Diane, and she knows because we've been in several meetings discussing this in Portland and Sweden. There's a new thing we're talking about now called the New Artisan Movement, and I haven't told you this, but I got approval from the University of Wales two days ago to actually set up a three-year multidiscipline edu part-time education program, which does nothing whatsoever to do with cases, but gives you one-on-one -on -one courses in anthropology, psychology, biology, ecology, and then gets you to apply those to real world cases and to keep a case book of what you've done over three years working with experienced people and that's called professionalization. Going on a two day course and calling yourself a master on the basis of a multi-choice questionnaire is highly dubious. Yeah? Going on a one week course and then being authorized to make money provided you pay me royalties by doing the same training is basically the same thing as a neuro-linguistic programming contract. All right? It's a desire to basically create rigid stability, rigid process. It's a contradiction of our job. So, sorry, I couldn't resist saying that. I think that was probably what I was meant to do anyway. Right? I'm more brutal than I am. I don't have to be nice to people about this. Either way, open to questions. That, that gives you a sense of what will come back, all right, just for way of warning. Oh, sorry, Dave Snowden. Um, not many people know this, but at a pub in Cheltenham um, something like 20 years ago, myself, 
a woman from Logica and Ed from Cambridge Scientific set up the DSDM consortium. Um, because we said if we don't actually have a standards body, we're never going to sell this bloody stuff, all right? And that was one of the founders, you know, long, long time ago on that. I actually think we've lost a lot from both XP and from, and from DSDM in that we've over-focused on delivery and we've under-focused on user understanding. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, you know, that, that was my background on that. After that, I became a C-level executive. I've been a, an IBM executive, done all sorts of things in my life. And I set up Cognitive Edge about nine or 10 years ago to apply complexity thinking um, into business in general. Yeah. Can Ask I have Dave anything. Mind? I shouldn't have told you what I thought up front. I've scared the living daylights out of people. <laughs> Nobody wants to defend safe? Yeah, okay. Uh, hi. Uh, the Agile Manifesto has been around for a long time. So do you think there should be a new version? Like, you know, if you had to add something or take something off the manifesto, any thoughts? I think we, we need a yes, but manifestation of the Agile. The, the Agile Manifesto was written at a point in time, yeah, at, in a context where we'd switch things away from supply and into, de sorry, away from demand and into supply. And it swung the pendulum. And I think we could do with swinging the pendulum back a little bit. You know, it's kind of like users actually don't or aren't always right. And to be quite honest, most Agile techniques assume they don't understand software anyway, all right? So we, we didn't really implement that one. I don't think we need another manifesto. I mean, they tried that with Stoos, yeah? And that was what I just call new age fluffy bunnydom run mad, all right? It's just, let, let's get together and say how wonderful people would be if everybody was nice to each other, everybody was open, everybody consulted with you. I mean, anybody can do that, right? Um, we actually need people now to start to institute methods and tools which actually apply what we understand about systems and what we understand about people and stop the sort of idealism, you know, get into deep pragmatism, you know, get into sustainable approaches which increase the interaction between unarticulated, I'll talk about this on Friday, unarticulated user needs and unanticipated technology capability. At the moment, we're still taking a linear process of expecting users to define what they want and then we'll deliver it more effectively. But as I said to somebody over the break, you can draw a non-linear, you can draw a linear process as a circle, it doesn't make it non-linear. All right, it's still linear, all right, even if you put a feedback loop into it. I'd also say, I would, and one of the things I'm doing at the moment is going back to Denning. Um, because from work I did with Drucker before he died, I'm absolutely convinced the complexity thinking which I and others are pioneering has more in common with scientific management than it does in systems thinking. And the reason is if you go back to the pioneers of scientific management, like Denin, like Drucker, yeah, like Taylor, they respect the role of human judgment. Yeah? They didn't try and replace it. Yeah? They automated what they could automate. Yeah, effectively, they did physical augmentation. Uh, what we should now be looking at is using technology for cognitive augmentation, but not cognitive replacement. And part of the problem with the big data hype and with a lot of IT development and with most of systems thinking from Six Sigma onwards, yeah, and well, from business process re region onwards, it tried to reduce people to an engineering diagram. Yeah? And I say, come back to it. You look at anything, all right? And I could almost show a brochure which was in the handout, you know, the safe diagram. That's an engineering diagram. It's not an ecological map. Yeah? We need to start to think about organizations as ecologies, not as engineering processes. And the scientific management people respected that. They respected apprenticeship models. They assumed that people would spend three to four years before, in multiple roles, before they were given management responsibility. They left space for people to make judgments and you had to take responsibility for making those judgments. You couldn't fall back and, and actually blame a spreadsheet. Yeah? So, you know, long answer to the question. I think we need to get back to some of that stuff and we need to start to use technology as a tool and the whole point about a tool is where you pick it up, it should fit your hand. You shouldn't have to buy or re-engineer your hand to fit the tool, all right? And yeah, that's part of the problem. We're, we're not making tools, yet. Yeah? We're imposing a constraint on human intelligence which matches the way that computers work, and that's limited compared with human capacity. Thank you. You never get short answers from a Welshman when he's jet-lagged. I should just warn you about that. <laughs> yeah, my question is related to, again, uh, 
a certification because Brahma Alliance is uh, uh, the leader and the sponsor. So my question is, uh, what I, it's my view. But what I am seeing is the current certification is not working mm. because the quality is not there. Just uh, two days training, you should have 26 or 28 bucks in your pocket, and then you are certified. Yeah. And well, uh, actually, you are certified, but it's a different sense of the word. <laughs> so what I'm, uh, uh, my question is, so are we, uh, shall we expect a change in the way current certification is happening? Can we uh, think it like a way that somebody submits their experience and then they yeah. get a questionnaire on the front? And then they are uh, valued on their psychological, on their managerial, or on their team uh, spirit, and other aspects of aligned values, or it's going to be like the same? I'd be very careful about rating. I mean, I, I agree in broad principles, all right? So let's talk, I mean, we've been talking about this now for two years now, isn't it, Dan? And I so say I went to the Vice Chancellor at the university on Monday because we're setting up a new centre for applied complexity, uh, which is going to be distributed between University in Wales, Stellenbosch University in South Africa, one of the New Zealand, so we're working on that. Uh, one of the programmes which is going to come through that is basically a three-year programme. Now, in that three-year program, you will be expected there'll be a curriculum list of the humanities in the main. We will do no case studies, yeah, because actually cases are past practice and they don't replicate if the world is complex anyway. That, you know, this is the confusion of correlation with causation, uh, which is a real problem in management science. But the point is, you've got to go to a university-valid institute to do your 101 course in anthropology. We don't mind which university. We're not going to offer that. Yeah, because then we'd be actually selling the training. You know, it would be one of the things the university can do, but basically we don't mind which university you do, but you've got to do some anthropology, yeah, which would hugely improve IT people full stop, yeah, because they start to understand something about people. You've got to do something on ecology. You've got to understand the difference between acceptation and adaptation. So there's a curriculum of knowledge that you have to acquire. It's kind of like, almost like creating generalists. Yeah? At the same time as having to pass that by examination in whatever university, You've also got to keep a workbook, and we're working on an electronic form of this, yeah? by which every experience you have is recorded in the workbook and certified by the people around you. Yeah? Now, if you look at it, that's the way lawyers and accountants and doctors produce professionals. And nobody grants them certificates in the sense that the Agile community talks about certificates. And it's a five to seven year program. Yeah? In fact, if they're vets, they're even better. My father never allowed us to go to a doctor because he was a vet. And he said, vets have two years more training and they don't trust what people say, so I'm going to do the diagnosis, right? But that's, you know, the, the principle is an extended period, and it involves two things, practical wisdom and theoretical wisdom. And there's far too many people in Agile, I had this, this argument with Ron Jeffries all the time, but he's coming around, who say, if it works, it must be okay. All right, well, if it works, it just worked that one time. You don't know it's going to work again. If you don't understand why something worked, you shouldn't try and repeat it or scale it. Yeah? And I think, yeah, that's the problem we got. People are producing methods and certification based on two or three case studies reported by people who have left the companies to join the consultancy firm. All right? Now, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I've been in companies. I don't buy that. All right? Um, also, novelty works the first time. The first two or three times you do something, it will always produce results. It's called the Hawthorne effect. All right, so actually producing a method and claiming success based on limited cases and then relying on self-reported success from people who make money out of training your method, that's not professionalization. That takes several years. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Dave. I think cool. two questions, but you've nailed it. <laughs> I know we are running a little late. We do need to kick off the, uh, the job fair, but I do want to invite Todd Little to come up and quickly introduce himself. All right, uh, Todd Little. Um, some people call me Mr. Toad. I don't know why, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm a software executive uh, for IHS. Um, I uh, came to give a little bit of history of how I got into Agile. I, I, um, I came into an organization via an acquisition in the, in the 1990s, and it came into just this amazing culture. And we were producing software that was transforming our, our industry, and this culture was sustaining. We were integrating companies, uh, and one of the things we did as an organization was we put together conferences like this 
and brought together worldwide all our developers. You know, salespeople have their conferences. It's very rare for development to pull together developers. And the thing is, we were finding that if we really wanted to be good at integrating, integrating our companies that we were pulling together, and that was really the important part of our purpose. Our purpose was we were going to transform the industry by integrating software. And in order to do that, we felt that we had to integrate people. So we pulled them together into a worldwide developers conference. I happened to get really good at running conferences. Uh, serendipity, I ran into Alistair Coburn in, in 2002, and he, we're at the bar, at the MIT bar at a conference, and he pulls out some diagrams that his wife had drawn and said, which conference logo do you like? And I said, oh, really? You're going to run a conference? He said, yeah, we're going to run a conference. And I told, started telling him, well, you thought about this, 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 and this? And he said, no, we got to talk. So I um, ended up helping him uh, put together the Agile conference in the U.S., uh, went on to uh, really take that and, and uh, run it for a number of years. Uh, was on the Agile Alliance with, with Diana. Uh, was interested in me because I was the only non-consultant on the uh, Agile Alliance. Uh, everyone else was either a vendor or, or a consultant. So I was always trying to push a few ideas that were a little different and uh, take things a little bit different direction. Uh, I do remember the sort of, I was on two boards that were dealing with the certification question, both the Agile Alliance as well as the uh, APLN was also dealing with the certification question. Uh, so interesting how we, uh, how we had to step around and deal with that, uh, go through ideas around that. Uh, a couple other things about me, um, a bit of a data geek. Uh, I mean, I work for a data company now, but I've uh, looked at a lot of metrics and organization. Uh, also view myself as a globalist, been involved in global teams. Uh, in my view, if I'm a globalist, who knows, maybe an American imperialist uh, in some fashion. So, ask me anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, all companies run software. So, Agile as a software development process is uh, needed in every Why is it that we are limiting Agile to software development? So why are we limiting Agile? So I'm, I'm not one who limits, agile, limits uh, agile to software development, I guess. Uh, I, I would question that all things uh, re rely on software, because I do like to do a few things where software is not involved. You know, and uh, they seem a bit more natural that way. But um, uh, yeah, I think there's certainly in the industry, software is becoming more ubiquitous. So, I mean, it, it is the extent that, that all, almost all organizations are highly dependent on software of some form or another. Um, so, yeah, I, I like to think in terms of, of a bigger picture. Um, and, and really, many of the problems that I end up facing um, aren't really software problems. I mean, I spend most of my time not dealing with software problems. I'm, I'm dealing most of the time with with working with the business and helping them understand their business problems and how software can can work well to help them in their business. So, I don't know if that's helped the answer. So if you take the poll, most of the attendees of this conference come from software companies. So, uh, you know, it's not a, the, the movement is not as broad as you know, you or others who have liked to be. So, well, okay, so the Agile Alliance specifically said we're going to only work with software, and I think that was a good choice. Because one of the things you have to do is you have to figure out what you're going to be good at and what your market, target market is that you're going to go after. And so I think early on in the Agile Alliance life, it was really a smart choice to, to pull back and say we're going to work with software, because had they tried to take on more than software at the time, I think it probably would have failed. Actually, the APLN did try to move outside of software, started, had just a little bit of traction, and pulled back and ended up really you know, turning out to not be much more than software because it, there wasn't enough there and there wasn't enough momentum. Did, we didn't have the critical mass in order to take it beyond software. Now, did people have people taken this beyond software? Yes, quite a few people have gone independently, but I don't think you've got the same level of movement at that level. In IHS, uh, which came first, the employees' agile culture or the leader? So, if, so I came into IHS last year, and um, I came in really um, after the, so my boss came in about 
I'm not, about three years earlier, I think. But he took a position about, a, about six months or so before I came in. And um, so as I do a little bit of archaeology and look back, um, I think what well, he has made a huge difference because he came in from a product company. He came in with a very agile perspective. And so um, I think the interesting thing with IHS was IHS as a company had been very chaotic, as acquiring people, had a very, very good strategic direction, had guessed well that data and analytics was a real important thing. So they had a really good strategy. They've been acquiring, they've been growing, uh, they've been empowering a lot of things to happen at the, at the business level. They had really messed software up pretty badly. Uh, so when my boss came in, he had a very low bar to change things, and he's made an enormous difference and brought in you know, additional people and built leaders up that really have uh, embraced the Agile culture. And I think as soon as he was available to provide the air cover, the culture of the software development organization rapidly went behind him. So transforming the culture in this case was really easy because it was sort of organizationally the culture was there. It was, had this really messed up side because it got thrown into our IT, and I think my experience, almost every single IT organization is broken, so uh, I've been with product companies, and product companies that have IT organizations always think IT is broken, uh, and usually for a pretty good reason, because they're disconnected from their customers. Product companies are very, if you disconnect yourself from your customer as a product company, you're out of business. On an IT, you don't go out of business because you just change out the CIO every year, and it's not a problem. You just keep getting crappy service. Um, so now that my boss is in there, he's provided the air cover, he's provided the connection to the business, he can speak their language. Right? The key part of the executive and the software side is you've got to be able to speak their, the language of the business. You know, how do you enroll marketing? You start speaking the language of marketing. You fit, fit that in so that you bring him in to the conversation. You show them what's in it for them. What's in it for the business? How can we work with you? Have that, create the environment, create the culture, and I've found that developers are really easy to get across with, with, with that. I mean, they really understand it. They know, they're problem solvers, after all. And what we're doing is creating a culture where they can solve problems and make a difference. They just want to see their work done and, and have a difference. So if they get, you get the, the cultural part set, you get the clarity of purpose, you stop overloading them, you get prioritization and focus and start saying no to some things, some amazing things happen. can take one last question. <laughs> oh, a lot of people. Oh. Now they ask questions. I, I, earlier, they didn't ask any questions. I have 15 minutes available. And, <laughs> uh, uh, I did a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, what percentage of software projects across the world do you think follow Agile? Do you foresee a day when uh, all the projects are 100% Agile? So what percentage of projects are Agile? Or what percentage of projects claim they're agile? <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of projects claim they're agile? I don't know. Probably, but I, I actually don't know. That, I, I don't have that type of data. I mean, there are a lot of surveys out there that are, are strongly biased in a lot of different directions because of who they ask. Um, I still see a lot of. Pro I, I still say that uh, see a lot of projects that are not even close to being the potential that they could have. Right. So I, you know, I think it's a, a, a very small percentage that are actually performing well. I, I like how, how Diana put it. To, you know, the, probably what we're we seeing about uh, five percent that have really evolved to the to extreme level to a, a really strong performing level. Um, and uh, I mean, and, and that that survey results was of teams that already were declaring they were starting down the agile path. Right. So that's the of the 100%, the 100% that we divvy up of whatever that is, and I think of the, your starting point is probably of those claiming to be agile, you know, claiming to be agile maybe is the, in the 25 to 50% range. I don't, I don't have good numbers on that. You know, it's not, not an area. I tend to work more at the, the, the data that I've been collecting has more been on uh, uh, a bit of a passion around estimation and, uh, and risk, and so I've got a lot of data on that. I do look at other data too, but not too much. So I don't know if I can, Give a hey, true answer uh, I, I, I have one, one question here. Yeah. So um, th this, this, I think, is an interesting and controversial at the same time. Um, so we had this manifesto from 2001, the Agile Manifesto and the 12 Principles. Um, and I was here in this conference last year, and there were a bunch of 
you know, issues, uh, you know, people are talking about that they're having in agile adoption and scaling and so on and so forth. Uh, so on retrospection thought, I mean, this question is more to all the subject matter experts, basically, you know, you and the other folks out there who are sitting in the front row. Uh, have they ever kind of looked back and, you know, see that, you know, is that solving all the problems uh, that, that are there today? Is there time to kind of go back and look into the manifesto and see if there is something which, you know, which needs to be changed? Because I don't think there's, except the pigs and the chicken remark, I think, you know, except that, you know, nothing much has been changed uh, in the last, uh, you know, 14, 15 years. Uh, and we've been hearing the same problem, you know, every time, again and again, from different people in some form or the other form. So I'm I'm a little you know kind of a uh, little confused and you know disappointed at the same time that you know I mean if if that is what is solving the problem then you know where is the problem right I mean you know everything is there and you know so so that that's something which which you know is is, is something which is not clear to me. Okay, so let me try to give a quick answer to that, which probably won't be quick. Uh, so is it solving all the problems? Absolutely not, right? It's there's no chance that it can solve all the problems because. You can't solve problems with four statements, right? You, now, is it, is it providing guidance that's still valuable today? I believe it is. Um, what are the areas that I would say is probably was neglected? Uh, I think from my side, I think that a lot of what we see that has, got, has driven the Agile community has been much of a bottom-up, technology-up-driven perspective. I don't think it's, it really has really done a good job of engaging the business properly. I think Jeff uh, brought that up very clearly that you know what he's spending his time with is the we start I think too often we've started with the assumption that users know what they want or that the business knows what they want and the reality is they they don't. I mean they have some the, some users know what they want, sometimes we know what they want, but this is all a learning experience and so getting fast feedback and handling understanding the challenges we have in, in really trying to figure out what's the right thing to be doing in the first place. His, it's always been the problem. I think the manifesto glosses it over a bit way too much. And uh, so, and, and Jeff made a good point on that earlier. So, and I think Dave did, many of them, many people did already on that same, same issue. I see people just okay. trying really hard to squeeze in questions. <laughs> okay. We're running short of time. Uh, just one, one thing. Okay, so we are uh, conducting this uh, uh, manifesto uh, year on, year on, and we're conveying the messages, making sure that when people are aware of it and all those things. So do we have a goal from the Agile team all over here or who are leading the front row or this one? So what is that we're going to achieve in this year? Do we have a roadmap or we are just having this communication done and go home and forget it. It's actually there in our uh, Microsoft project plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it will be always there in the plan, but how yeah. are we making sure that when there is some implementation yeah. Yeah, back, from back this in, year to next year? Yeah, back in 2001, we worked up a Microsoft project and, and this year's roadmap calls for, for that exact question to be coming out. So, so I'm glad to see that, that, that we were pretty good in our estimation and predictability. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know it is very hard to answer. So, so I think the, the thing that's, it's, you're, so I think what the, I'm, I'm hearing asking is, well, is there a plan of where the Agile community is taking things? And the thing is, there is the, the Agile community is here. It's you. It's, it's not some thing out there. It's not an, you know, the Agile Alliance as an organization, for example, is just a holding body. You know, we spend a lot of time on the, trying to figure out what is the Agile Alliance. And the Agile Alliance, we concluded, is a holding space for the community to take its, take its and drive itself where it needs to go, right? So the, all this question about is there a need for a manifesto, a, a change to the manifesto, my recommendation is write one and start circulating it, right? And if you want to see the change or, or come up with something new, right? Um, right now, I don't think, my view is as from a marketing perspective, there's probably, there's probably not right for it, right? Because there's enough momentum already in what's there to, to take things continuous. Now, we have the other challenges I think Dave addressed very well, is what's the ecosystem that's driving this? 
the ecosystem that's driving this is you know the certification drives training, training people make money. So has certification worked? It's absolutely worked for training companies, right? Training companies have been a wonderful beneficiary of certification. It's a great ecosystem. One of the problems we had when the Agile, so the Agile Alliance looking at this and the APLN looked at certification, we looked at it and said, well, we're not against certification. We just don't like, oops, sorry, we don't like that model, which is about training and certificated based on a couple of days of training or answering a test. If anything, we want something that's more experience based and has some, some real meaning to it. In that case, the problem with that is that has no real economic benefit for training companies. They can't sell their training based on that type of a model. Right? So it died. We said, okay, if you want to do it, do it, but it has to be this type of style. It has to be something different. It's going to be certification 2.0 or certification 3.0. Certification 1.0 is the one that has the economic model that fuels it. Okay. So you know, if you want to start a manifesto, find a way to market it and, <laughs> and circulate and get the ecosystem that funds it. Okay. What do you think is the most challenging aspect that needs to be addressed for agile adoption in a bigger organization? And uh, what should be the first thing that we should do in such a situation? Yeah, I'll get so it's hard to call out one particular thing because every organization is slightly different. Uh, some organizations, like, uh, when, so, so I was describing this culture, this beautiful, wonderful culture that we came into it through an acquisition. Well, just shortly after that, we were acquired by Halliburton. Halliburton's a big multinational American company, oh, well, American company with a, bit of, with a little bit of multinational to it. Uh, but it, it's not a software company. It sells cement, right? It, it's a very, very, and it's an operational efficiency model. We were a software company that was value generation. So inside that, we were, we were okay as long as they were arm's length away from us, but over time that eroded because uh, fortunately they'd screwed up another software company before us, so they knew that, that was, the organizational memory was there. Eventually that organizational went, memory went away and they thought they knew how to run software companies just as well as they knew how to go do oil field services. Um, so in that environment, the culture was the problem and you could only get so good on an agile, from an agile perspective because the culture was, was the structure and the leadership at the highest levels didn't support it. Coming to IHS, it's been very different. The, 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 the core things were there. What we really needed was, was my boss who came in and really provided the air coverage um, to, of the overall development organization to enable us to, to go off to each one of the, you know, our business units and, and run those according, you know, give us the autonomy and give us the ownership that we needed. So once you have that, in that, in that case it was much easier. So I think the executive support is key. Um, I think uh, there are other times where different problems. You may have just, you know, very, very poor talent to work with and other things. So fortunately, I've, I've got good talent to work with. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. I hope they have answered a few of your questions and you have a lot more questions left. Right? Because otherwise this conference would die. You wouldn't come back next year. There has to be an economical model to it, right? I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, obviously, in this one hour, we're not going to answer all your questions, but you might get some thought process around how people are looking at it. And you know that would start some conversations within you. So hopefully, this is fueling curiosity, and you would probably go and mingle with other people and ask questions and get their perspective on it. So I really appreciate all these folks who came up on stage and shared their honest opinion on the questions that were randomly thrown at them. Uh, I know it's difficult to answer uh, impromptu, but you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. So now we're going to uh, switch over. And the, the next thing that we, we planned for this evening was to kick off a job fair. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of context around why we are doing this, what's in for the Agile Software Community of India to be running this. Uh, we are not a consultancy company. We don't place people. We don't do any of this. Why are we running a job fair? What does this have to do with us? Uh, in fact, the job fair, last year we piloted that. Uh, the reason we did that was uh, we would get uh, two reasons for companies to sponsor the conference. And one of the main reasons for companies to sponsor this conference was uh, to be able to find good, talented uh, people, uh, whether agile or not, a secondary, but you know, 
good talented people was something that they really wanted and they felt that the agile community seems to have some of those uh, kinds of people that they are interested in, right? And so they were sponsoring the conference, they were supporting us uh, running the conference. But it got a little difficult for them to have an open conversation around, you know, can you join us? You know, are you, are you interested in it? This is an awkward conversation to have at a conference, right? Uh, it was also a little awkward because companies do send people in and then companies are a little scared, like, I, I don't want my people to get poached, right? It just doesn't feel right. So we said, we're going to call out a separate thing where we want to enable, we want to provide this platform where people who are trying to find good companies to work for and uh, companies who are trying to find good people to work with them, uh, you know, we want to be able to provide that kind of platform. So with that thought process, we basically, uh, you know, last year we launched the job fair. Uh, we had uh, quite a few companies come in, but one of the mistakes we did last year was we kept it on after the conference was over because we didn't want any conflict with the conference itself. But what we realized is most people left after the conference and it was not a very successful, uh, it didn't really serve the purpose. So this year we tried to change it a little bit and we said maybe we give a couple of hours in the evening where the companies who want to participate in the job fair can come and quickly talk about what do they do, what they, what they are interested in, and then maybe people who like what they're doing or interested to hear more could visit them and then you know, have a more extended conversation over the next two hours. And we do this uh, three evenings. Uh, we're going to try it out this evening. We're going to see how is it going to helping, uh, is it really helping, and then we'll inspect and adapt from there. So with that, I would like to call upon uh, folks from JP Morgan to kind of quickly talk about uh, you know, if, how they want to position themselves, what they're looking for, and uh, you know, help people understand where, what kind of people they're looking for. Can we have you quickly? Yep. So what we're going to do is uh, we have three companies who are participating in this today. Each of them would quickly come and present, uh, you know, what they're looking for. And then people are, yeah, you know, they will be back in those stall areas. You can go visit them, All right? If you're uncomfortable sticking around, that's absolutely fine. We understand you could leave, right? We don't want to hold you up. But uh, I would appreciate if you give five minutes to listen these guys out. So I, I head up recruiting for JP Morgan for a couple of businesses from a technology standpoint for India. And uh, the reason we are here today is not to bore you through some 15, 20 slides. No, we just want to talk some real stuff, help you understand what JP Morgan is, what we do in the market, and what we're looking for. Okay. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take too long, but uh, uh, I, I just want to open up with asking people. I, I want to understand from folks around the room how much do you guys know about J.P. Morgan? So just an open question to everybody. Does anybody know how many cities in India does J.P. Morgan have offices in? Anybody? I'm just, I'm just opening this up. It can be a guess. It can be, it can be anything. If somebody knows about it, I just want to check. Anybody knows how many offices in India? A wild guess? OK, somebody who answers can get a prize. I'll throw a little twist. Absolutely. So three offices. Uh, do, you know the, do you know which cities? Bang on. So three offices in India, Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad. Okay? And uh, obviously, Mumbai is the largest. Bangalore is growing. And now we are in Hyderabad. What, what makes JP Morgan today is five key lines of businesses, like this, like this hand, you know, coming together, a fist, which is something that is not stoppable. JP Morgan has five key lines of businesses. Corporate and investment bank, asset management, enterprise technology, corporate, uh, consumer and community banking, which is our retail business. And last but not the least is our commercial banking business. So these are the five key lines of business that are spread across all, all parts of India and uh, where we have technology presences across India. So that is, that is from a line of business perspective. So yes, we have a presence across these places. We have a huge strength of organization. But I'm sure all of you are asking this question in terms of what is in it for you as a technologist to work with a bank like JP Morgan rather than work with any other you know, tech house or any other product development firm uh, on the street. And you know, five, five points. Given the business that we are in, it's ever-changing. 
it's a very fast and dynamic business. The market is so volatile that we are expected to live up. So what is in it for a technologist? We, ex we expect our technologists to be as creative as possible because every technologist in JP Morgan is empowered to come up and make those, because we are challenged every day with something that goes around in the market that we need to make changes in the way we work and we develop our software. So given this, you know, it, it, is, it is very interesting for, for a technologist to work with JP Morgan. Second one is our impact and reach. We have offices over 100 countries. That is huge. We touch people across these countries. We touch markets across these countries. And last but not the least, we touch products across these countries. Hence, for us to be in this highly competitive environment, we just can't go out there and just you know, build and develop some lame software. Hence, we need to be up and running, creative and innovative. Lastly, technology shop in JP Morgan is of our own. We call the shots. We create softwares, we build applications for ourselves. We don't make it for others. Hence, it's with us to be as innovative as we can and as creative as we can. I want to read out something which is, you know, which is a pretty key message from some of our leaders. So we have pegabytes of data running across our internal cloud computing platform. You know, our firms, like I said, the market is so volatile that our firm's response to volatile conditions, our ability to react quickly and intelligently, and our margin of success all over competitors often comes down to technology. Like I said, technology is big. Everybody wonders, JP Morgan is a bank. What do you guys have to do in technology? But technology plays a big, big, big role. Every line of business, like I spoke about, the five lines of businesses, all of them have technologists who are empowered to take decisions in the organization. And these are the hats, these are the thinking hats that we look at you know, in order to make us where we are today. I just want to show you something quickly and, and you know what, what is in it for you guys to be a part of our firm. 58,000 servers managed by our infrastructure engineers connecting our employees around the globe. 30,000 technologists, and you won't believe, India has over 8,500 technologists. And the 30,000 technologists represents 11% of our entire global workforce. 7,200 applications developed and enhanced by our software developers to improve client experiences. I've missed adding something here. We spend year on year over $8.5 billion only consuming technology, which shows how strong a believer JP Morgan is in technologies, in, in, in hiring good technologies for the organization. What, what are we looking for? JP Morgan has moved from what we used to do five years now, five years down the line and now. We're looking for strong, hands-on technologists. Yes, we are going the HR way, we want to grow lean. But at the same time, we're looking for strong, hands-on technologists. We're looking at people, even across the cadre, even at senior levels, who are able to drill down and get down into coding or whatever you may want to call it. But we're looking for hands-on technologists. And with all of this comes together with something I want to talk about, people agenda. Two minutes more. People agenda. And, and you may wonder that you know, some of you in the market, and we, I, as a recruiter, I keep hearing people saying, you know, I don't have domain expertise. I have never worked with a bank. So how am I going to add value to your bank? Not required. We're looking for strong technologists. We're looking for somebody who has the acumen, who can be, who can be an evangelist, and somebody who can come to the firm and add that asset from a technology perspective. We will give you the training. We will provide the domain training, the functional training. We have the experts in the bank, and that's something that we will do for you. Second, the firm is very, very high on mobility, career mobility, moving people internally. Last year, we closed 2,000 roles within the bank, and 25% of them were closed via internal mobility. So we believe in bringing in talent, grooming them in, and just not letting them go after two years, three years. But we keep talking to them to ensure that you know, if there's another role in five businesses, a numerous roles in the organization. We're currently working on over 1,000 roles. Last year, close to 1,000 roles, and mobility is a big aspect point there. I don't see too many women in the round, but I, I did see them, so I was a little happy when, I, when, when, the last, when the panel session was going on. And I want to talk about diversity. Very, very high on diversity. One of our key objectives in JP Morgan. Not, not just because we want to increase our male and female ratio, but we definitely feel that there's a different thinking between both the genders. Globally, Diversity is not only male and female, but has color and all, all the other aspects. But in India, it's male and female. And 
we just, we just concluded a drive to commemorate International Women's Day on the 8th of March. And you won't believe, we had over 1,000, 1,200 people who walked into our organization, and we were able to offer close to around 80 people. You know? So we are, we are stressing the fact that we are looking for women, women technologists, including obviously male technologists, but this is another key factor. I just want to end with one last thing. Uh, one of our key believers, three things in fact, innovation, innovation, innovation. Now I'm not trying to be Ekta Kapoor, but innovation, innovation. These are three things which is one of the biggest, biggest proponents that we look for from a JP Morgan perspective, because that is one thing that helps us service our customers with a first class business in a first class way. So ladies and gentlemen, I can go on talking all night about JP Morgan, but I would like to keep some suspense when we open up the job fair. So we will be there to answer any kind of queries you want. This is just the trailer that I've spoken about. Work with the bank and you will watch the rest of the movie. Thank you. Right. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, folks. Glad to be here with uh, fellow Agile enthusiasts. My name is Amber Jamal. And my name is Pradeep. Uh, we represent QAI. So what do I have today evening to share with you about what, what we are here um, in the job fair for? QAI, born in the USA, Orlando, Florida, 30 years, young. 300 clients across 30 countries. Um, over 600 person years, to be politically correct, I have to stop using man years and woman years, isn't it? Cumulative experience, present and operating out of USA, India, China, and Singapore. That's QAI in short for you. Amongst the clients I spoke about, let me share a story about one of our marquee clients. We have 12 years of awesome relationship with this customer, partnered with them for 40 plus transformation programs across eight countries and I don't have the count of the numerous working groups and business areas. And they have these engagements for a single account have clocked more than tens of crores in INR for QAI in consulting, revenue alone. That customer is Accenture. So you'll be glad to know we are hiring. And that's the very purpose of being with you here this evening. Now, what kind of person and people and talent are we acquiring and looking for as a consulting firm? No better way than to share with you a story of my colleague, Aditya Bhalla. Let me tell you about Aditya. Aditya's story started 14 years back. Fresh IIT enthusiastic graduate working as a marketing and sales business development professional in Microland. Was interested for, you know, looking for exciting stuff in life, comes on board QAI as a process consultant, is not happy. And we are happy that he is not happy. Because he moves on to explore his passion in business process improvement and statistics through Lean, then moves on to Six Sigma, then to innovation. And when he jumps into innovation, he comes to know about a model called trees. Have you heard of trees? Trees, yeah. And he's excited to know about Triz and learn more about it and explore and go on this adventure. But um, what happened? He faces a peculiar roadblock. To be really a master of Triz, knowing that this is one of the inventions of a Russian group of scientists, Archula, he needs, he's, he's interested in learning the language. So he goes to Russia, takes a flight, learns Russian learns Triz from the masters in Russia, and comes back to India to propagate and disseminate his knowledge and his experience and wisdom. Um, and he becomes one of the two or three Triz masters that are there in the country today. We are looking for the next Aditya Bhalla in Agile. What are the attributes that we are looking for in what I told you just now? And if you happen to be sharing common philosophy and interest in um, 
having been there. Okay, so here, here are some of the attributes. Okay, I know your laptop is already glitching. You have, a flick, you have a flipper for that? Okay, wonderful. So if you happen to be sharing these common values and, and common interest, um, you've been there, done that, want to explore unexplored horizons, work with constantly changing environments, culture, technology, clients, geographies, and whatnot, then QAI is the place for you. We are young enough and not young enough to perpetually learn, change, and make an impact. So we are a team which wants to make a difference in its own way, in every space, by excellence. And driving excellence denotes or characterizes the QAI team. So we are um, here, and we'd like to I've timed myself, Naresh. I'd like to have you over at a stall. Those who are interested profiles want to share with us what your interests are. Uh, we'll be giving away first 20 um, uh, you know, interested profiles, submitted uh, T-shirts from QAI. But more than anything else, as I said, we invite you to become a part of this enthusiastic young consulting team, 160 strong. And come and join us going back Let's put a ding in the universe. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Pradeep. Pradeep, me, and Jonu would be at our stall. Pradeep is from our North America operations. Jonu heads China and Middle East, and I look after consulting business for India. Thank you, Naresh. Thank you. We had uh, Sabre also participating. Is anyone from Sabre here to present? don't see anyone. So I guess that's it. Those are the two companies. They'll be back at the stalls. Please go visit them and uh, have a discussion with them. Thank you again. Uh, dinner has already started. We'll see you tomorrow at 9, 9 a.m. sharp.